You're listening to The Starting Zone, a podcast about World of Warcraft and the people who play it. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft and people who play it. Today is May 20th, 2024, and my name is Spencer Downey. Thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. I'm joined today, as always... By my co-host Jason Lucas. Jason, how are you doing this fine Monday? Uh, Spencer, hello. I'm here. I am. I don't know if I'm doing well, but I'm here. Well, as long as it's not cataclysmic, right? As long as yeah, you know. Yeah, it's. Uh, well, man, it's slightly <laughs> sub that. At least I'm having a. Yeah, my week is off to a rough start, but I am here. It is not. It's not WoW related. Luckily, WoW remains a a sanctuary. But um, yeah, it's been. Uh, you know, it's been a big week, obviously, um, kind of a, a, a slower news week, as you might expect. So you know, stuff is kind of now settling in a bit. But we do have we do have some some forward looking stuff to talk about. We do yeah. have another big release this week. I mean, like, geez, just since the last time we spoke, they pushed a PTR build. They pushed uh, MOP remix and they are pushing Cataclysm today. Yep. The, just in, in an, like an eight day span or something, maybe a seven day span. I, f I forget exactly when that PTR build came out. So uh, their live ops team is real busy. Uh, I'll put it that way. Uh, just a lot of stuff to play, uh, which is cool. And I, you know, I've been playing a lot, obviously. Um, and it's nice. I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, there were times in Dragonflight where it was like, dude, I like I want to do stuff, but there's kind of no real reason to. And uh, season four cleans it up a lot because you have clear paths to getting stuff that you want. And that makes it more attractive to play alts and stuff. You know, I, I barely touched them at all in season three. In fact, I shouldn't even put it that way. I didn't touch them at all in season three. You know, they were kind of stagnant from season two. and But now I'm getting more back into it because it's like, oh there's actually a benefit to doing this. There's yeah. a light at the end of this tunnel, and that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and you want people to feel like if they're coming back to the main game, they have a chance to catch up, see everything, do what they want to do, because that's, as much as that might not be, this might not be the moment where that's happening right now, give it two or three months. We'll see that happen, that big resurge of player base come su suddenly back in as we, you know, prepare for the, the pre-patch event that'll be going on, and that'll be a uh, an exciting time for the game for sure. So having those systems in place... For this patch is really important and so i'm glad that they are because it, it is encouraging more players to dive in and do that and now we're of course leading off the show with uh what happened this past week in world of warcraft moving into what's going on this week in the live game of dragonflight and then as jason said there's a lot going on this week so we will we will not be bouncing around we will progress our way through this stuff uh moving from live game into alpha and then into the Cataclassic announcement and into Season of Discovery stuff and then the Mop Remix. We'll probably have a lot of chat about Mop Remix here at the top of the show with our experience this past week. But I don't think there's a lot of news we're going to talk about Mop Remix later in the show. It's just going to be top of the show, what's going on this past week, and then we'll hop into main Dragonflight stuff. So everyone has an idea of what we're moving into. All right, Jason, this past week in World of Warcraft. Yes. What you uh, Very busy. Um, we got our revenge on Heroic Razageth, as, a, as you might expect that we would. Um, it was a completely different experience from, you know, night one of season four, night two of season four with basically no ramp up yet. It just kind of fell over. So that was cool. Um, you know, everybody or almost everybody got their achievements for doing all three raids on Heroic. So that's nice. Um, and then we had plenty of time for some Mythic. Uh, you know, Mythic Aranog is a gimme. Uh, I think we did we did Mythic Aranog actually on Tuesday just to do it right away, see if we get some Diurnus Chosens out to the group on nice. the Mythic track. Um, so we did that, and then we did Heroic, uh, you know, Heroic Vault, and we did Aranog, and then everybody who didn't get their Diurnus, Diurnus Chosen hearthed out to go buy it from the vendor, <laughs> including <laughs> me, uh, which was, you know, I mean, that was the thing. It's like, okay, if I get this drop, then I'll buy the next thing on the list, but, you know, it doesn't make sense to spend the bronze before I at least see what happens. Um Wednesday we came back and we just had Mythic Taros and it honestly took almost the entire night. I think I think we started mm. on it. You know we started on it fresh at seven thirty. I think it was about ten after nine, which is like twenty minutes shy of the end of raid time. By the time we we downed it, um, which was weird. I mean it, we were reprogging it right. Um, a lot yeah. of the people that we were playing with back then we are not playing with now. A lot of the people we are playing with were not doing Mythic Taros back in. 2022 early 23 um 
So, you know, and it also it's I'm rusty. It's not like I was keeping up to date on mythic tarot. So, you know, that that's been out of my mind for a long time. But, you know, it's a very scripted dance. It's just like the fight is like doing a very deadly version of the hokey pokey. And um, <laughs> like, good yeah, description. Good description. yeah and it, it takes a long time to learn. It does. It, but it's frustrating when, you know, some of the raid knows what they're doing and then the rest of the raid is learning and you're kind of watching that learning curve. But it was quite accelerated, right? We, we were learning in real time pretty fast. Uh, we have a lot of power compared to where we might typically at this point in a, in a season. So it was cool to see people kind of dial it in and figure out what they were doing and get the boss down. Plus, it means a mythic uh, raid vault choice for everybody tomorrow. Um, I ended up doing like a reasonable number of keys, like not an absurd number of keys. I did eight tens because I want to get those 522 choices. I want to conserve crests and get 522s and not 519s. Um, so that was nice, but the cap is really high. You know, I'm trying to cap out on aspect crest just so I can get all my slots unlocked to max level and just kind of feel like that part is over. And then whatever, do eights for vault keys or, or what have you, you know. Um, but 120 is a lot. That's, that's a lot of timed tens and or raid bosses and stuff so I, I threw in like a couple eights or nines or something just to get some other crests up over 2700 rating i got those last two tens i hadn't timed in time this past week uh it wasn't like my favorite combo but it wasn't it, it felt better than the previous week honestly so that was nice i i think it might be hard to continue to find interest to do keys at this level this consistently for mm. much longer um, just because for one thing, you know, season four is not, it, it doesn't represent some kind of like really long tail of progression or whatever. Like we, we have now power spiked re absurdly and everything's a bit more incremental now. And I think people are going to start losing interest, but I still want to keep going. Like I want to get all my slots maxed out. Um, I, I've been staying active on the monk and the druid. I, I feel like two alts is like manageable for me at this point. I just take a day and it's like, okay. Today's the day I do Last Hurrah on the Monk. I'll do Time Walking Dungeons. I'll do two LFR bosses at least. I'll get my Bullion, and I'll get a Vault Choice, and I'll get my Weekly. And then I'll take one other day, and I'll do the Druid. So I did that. Um, a, a correction from something I was talking about uh, last week. You do get, like, the, the items you get from the Weeklies from Time Walking are not on the Awakened track. They have the Awakened tag on them, which basically means nothing other than they came from Season 4, which you'd be able to tell because they're, you know, 493 or whatever. Right. Like, or 502. I, I forget what they actually come out at, but... Which is kind of... It's it's just weird. that Like, they're using the word Awakened all over everything this season, so it could be a bit confusing. Like, the Awakened track and an Awakened item do not mean the same thing. But, um, you know, still, it's pretty nice to get... Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get, like... Uh, trinkets done on on these tunes or something and it's like i'm not really going to rate on them right so the, those are items i'd never have access to there's some really good rate trinkets and jewelry and stuff in this expansion so it's nice to be able to just put in a little bit of time and go okay i got that thing all right this week or next week i'm going to buy this next big upgrade and it's going to feel really good so i'm getting close to the point where like the 480s you get from the outdoor world don't even matter for those tunes which is just less stuff i have to do on them and Maybe I'll rotate in. You know, I think I would like to get the Paladin going and stuff just to gear up a bit. Um, I also did just a ridiculous number of Garrosh kills in Siege of Orgrimmar this week, um, yeah. but they bore no fruit. I was doing my all my 70s and some of my 60s and some of my 50s, and that started getting really weird because with all the squishes and everything, like I have characters that used to be max level at one point in time in like BFA, let's say, all of their gear is now like item level 75 and mythic garage 25 man drops like item level 126. So <laughs> even though I'm way higher level, my gear is no good. I finally figured out like, oh, I should do this gear update thing because it's actually not yeah. terrible. Yeah. So I did that on a couple of them and that helped. Also I have heirlooms. So like the heirlooms will bring them up to like being a higher item level than what garage actually drops. So yeah. um, I had a couple of really weird experiments there though with tunes in like level 75 gear fighting a boss that drops level 126. And even though I'm you know, 20 levels higher than it. I'm like, why isn't this dying? But, um, yeah, yeah, that was, <laughs> there's been some weird stuff with the numbers in the game over the last few years. I've definitely appreciated that they put in the, uh, the gear catch up that they did to be able to sort of help with that sort of thing. Cause I've had that with a couple of tunes too, that I logged in and was like, oh yeah, sure. I'll accept this. And I'm like, oh, they just gave me a bag of loot. This makes sense. And then you're like, 
but why would they just give the and you realize oh okay so this is gear for my current level that's baseline for my current level based off the fact that they've now done weird squishes so technically i'm wearing gear at an item level that is like 40 or item levels lower than it should be for what i'm currently doing like this is a very weird kind of mechanic yeah 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 like they squished all that stuff but then like yeah your existing gear didn't move and i didn't really understand the point of the gear update at first and i yeah. thought like well this is just this is for people who are like way too disengaged to really understand what's even happening but really it's to fix the problem that they sort of created yeah, they with created the level squish yeah. so yeah. yeah i so i don't know i get i guess if if you have a tune you haven't logged in on a while and you're thinking should i do this the answer is probably yes, yes. yeah um take the free stuff was, it's good yeah, like it's real. It's really it's very low impact in terms of like I don't know. It's not like wiping your tune out or whatever. It's it's okay, and it's you know yeah. You get you get some bags, and you get you get gear that's actually relevant for your current character level. Um, and then of course like the the rest of the time in WoW this week was uh, MOP remix um, playing a warrior. I don't really have anything I want to level, so I want to play the game, which means I want to play the class I like, which means I'm playing a warrior. Um, I hit level 70, like, Saturday morning. I was doing mostly quests, some dungeons here and there, but as I went along, I was just like, I want to open these boxes. I like turning in the quests and opening the boxes, and I want to open a box every 90 seconds to three minutes, so... Um, <laughs> or you know, four like, of do... them. Yeah, I yeah, get that. Right, yeah, so, like, doing the other stuff was just, like, it was fine, It was and it was fun playing with people and stuff, obviously, but I was like, I'm just going to quest up till max, um, and then I kind of put it down for the rest of the weekend like i played a bit saturday morning and i didn't pick it back up until last night uh we had scheduled uh, raid night um we immediately ran into kind of a big bummer because i had 22 23 people that wanted to play right and there are no 25 man mogushan vaults or heart of fears or what have you the the lower level raids are not there is no 25 man version of them and they do not scale with group size right so that sucked because we couldn't all play together so we did an lfr which was uh, quite breezy, uh, right, with 22 of us or 23 of us from Guild or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we did the two wings of Mogushan Vaults. I only asked people to be ready to do Mogushan Vaults, which means level 25. So, um, you know, that was that was the only thing we could get into because some people just didn't level any higher than that, but that yeah. was fine. Um, then, we, then we split into two 10-man teams, which was okay but like i hate having to do that but there was just it didn't make any sense to do anything else it didn't make yeah. any sense to say well good night everybody see you tuesday you have 20 plus people online who want to do stuff so we we did that um and it was fine i mean we had we had a great time we kind of blasted through normal mogushan like it wasn't even there and we weren't even doing stuff right really but um and then we we were done and we still had time left. We were like, let's go do Heart of Fear. And so we finished the whole thing. The enti this entire process from like trying to walk into 25 man Mogashan and going, oops, to downing Empress Shekzir, that was like slightly more than two hours. That's how fast we're tearing through this stuff. So it was nice. I mean, I, I had concerns like, oh, is my character going to feel bad or whatever? Because I'm 70, but I haven't really done anything. And maybe a little bit at first but all of this stuff all drops item level 346 gear so by the time we were done with lfr i had a couple holes plugged anyway and then in normal raid i'm getting like 346 blues and stuff like that the blues have primary on them so that's really good and yeah by the end of it i was like okay I, this feels fine and then i did some heroic dungeons to try to get started on getting that achievement done so you can get a ring and they're a bit slow like it, they're slower than but they're certainly slower than like time walking dungeons in the live game. And they're kind of slower than what I remember them being like back when we were doing them for real, just because people are still powering up, but nothing was like really dangerous. So it was fine. I, I mean, I, I think last night, you know, I, I got all, like I said, I got all my gear situated to 346, and I think only one piece isn't a blue. I got a ton of gems, like the prismatic gems just kind of rain when you're doing um, raid and dungeon stuff. And, I got like 20k bronze or something for the evening, so uh, it was fun. I I, I think um, the the thing that I'm feeling a couple days into remix is like I uh, I don't really see what the point of any of this is for me as a player. Like I like it, like it's fun, but I don't need or want to level characters this way. And there isn't anything really 
attractive for me to buy in terms of the cosmetics and stuff. Like there's nothing that I must have as a result of participating in this. Um, I do think revisiting the content is really fun and playing with my friends and doing something kind of breezy and chill is fun. Um, but I, I think like the sort of pie in the sky or like top level goals of like, okay, I want to gear up to this point or whatever. Like the gear's not interesting. The Tinker Gems are really fun, and there's some really broken combinations that you can do, especially if you have, like, a raid full of people that are kind of exploiting this combo. Um, and, like, it feels good to always be, like, getting some power and stuff as you do whatever it is that you're doing. But it doesn't have that same sort of tension and, like, nice progression curve that the game traditionally has where you're working your way through an instance and through a difficulty and you're powering up and you're getting this kind of traditional gear and weighing like, okay, what stats do I want? What effects do I want? And how do I piece it together? Oh, let me get a set bonus, whatever. Th this stuff is like, it's, it's like way spikier, but then it flattens out way faster too. So I, I don't know. I, I, I like it. I'm having fun with it, but I, I don't really feel like there's anything in there where, I'm super compelled, you know, to really to, to, to put it as simply as I can. Like, I, I think it's cool and I like it and I'm going to play it, but I don't, you know, like even, even still at this point in season four, there's stuff on my checklist. I'm like, okay, I want to do this and that and that, you know, I have these items that I still sure, want to do. Sure. I have no such thing in remix at all. Well, like, and, and... I, don't, I don't have a thing on there. I like it, but what, you know, now that gets into sort of a more existential question of, what is the point of playing any video game? Well, right, no, it's to have I, fun, I guess. But like, you know, they're, they're, I think I think for me, it is sort of a, it, it's something that I'm sort of thinking about right now, a few days in. So that I think part of that question comes from people right now who play video games often feel like they are attempting to accomplish something. It's not just about having fun; it's about trying to accomplish something. And I, I think, and, and that's not you know a, a, a gross generalization. I'd say that that's a fairly common example we're seeing based off of the type of video games that are coming out at the moment. Uh, one of the things that I do every week is uh, play video games with a, a few friends um, on Friday nights or Saturday nights now. And those games are just fun. They, they, there's no progression. There's no big reward track you're on. There's no big thing you're trying to earn. It's just, let's just play a silly game for a good time. And I will say when I'm playing games by myself, as in when I'm not playing with this particular group of friends under the the guise of, hey, this is going to be silly drinking game style night uh, type of games, I, I want to be feeling like I'm efficiently using my time playing the video game that I'm playing. And I want to be feeling as though I am earning some sort of progression towards unlocking or doing something that I will enjoy about this game, whether that's like a Hearthstone battle pass or that's like a um world of warcraft currency earning to buy a mount or a transmog that i want or that's a, like whatever that is it feels like i there needs to be the goal of of accomplishing something and that and the hope that the pathway to doing that is fun right as opposed to the goal is having fun and if you happen to earn something that's great like it's a different kind of mentality what i'd say is unique about your situation is you've been very active in world of warcraft for a long time including when different heritage armors and whatnot came out, you were very active in, in going after those during the previous catch-up events where we had like 150% increased experience gain or 200% increased experience gain in these situations. You've taken advantage of those moments. And so this is another one of those moments, but it's another one of those moments where we don't have like earthen out, right? If earthen was out right now, you'd be like, dude, I'm leveling an earthen and we're getting the heritage armor for earthen and we're doing the earthen thing. Like you'd be all about that. And that would be your objective and your goal. But because this isn't tied to anything like that, I feel like you're like, well, I, I already have everything all leveled up. So the leveling part of this isn't interesting. I have characters who have other gearing paths that to me are more interesting in, in dynamic as far as gameplay for that goes. So I'd rather be playing the live game for that. There's these goals I have for the live game and there aren't really transmogs and stuff other than Tusk of Manoroth that I've heard you mention that you're interested in getting out of Mists of Pandaria. You already have the bronze to do that. You just need to kill Manoroth a bunch of times and then you'll be able to buy them. So you don't need to farm bronze necessarily. And that's the situation that you're in. So I entirely understand your perspective on that. From someone who has not done all of the heritage <laughs> perspective, um, I, I especially Horde side, like I just haven't played a lot of Horde side tunes. Uh, so I I hopped in and started leveling um, a, a character on Horde side to try and and one of the one of the gaps that I have to fill. 
Uh, I have this past, so the past week for me was was primarily mop. I'll just start off that way. It was primarily mop remix uh, for the amount of time that I put into it. I put about 15 hours into mop remix. I got my character to 63. He has about 18k bronze. Uh, he's only been leveling in outdoor content doing quests. I did not do any of the raid stuff because it wasn't something that super grabbed my appeal of, yes, let's hop in and try and do a pugged normal raid. Or LFR has also been something that just in general has not grabbed my appeal. And uh, I will say that uh, at first it was really, really neat finding all these abilities and feeling powerful and, you know, being able to like two, two shot or one shot mobs was crazy and a lot of fun. The, the character I'm playing is a monk, just for reference for people. And uh, I uh, definitely feel like that has tabled off and dropped off fairly quickly. Uh, when I started getting to the first set of vendors and looking through vendor stuff and recognizing that anything raid based is 5k and above anything toy based is 5k and above uh and those scale all the way up to the that 38.5k mark for some of these things and some of these toys and mounts and 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 uh particular mog items that were rare during the expansion and i was like oh that's okay so what what am i supposed to be feeling like as far as this type of currency gain goes well, you know, as Jason mentioned, uh, if you do a normal and some heroics and whatnot, you can get between 20 and 30k bronze in a, in a, in a day for spending three or four hours playing. And if you're someone who does a, a heroic clear or a mythic clear of one of the raids, you get 30k from what we've been told by devs is what you get from that. These are activities that not only require some sort of organization when it comes to heroic and, and mythic raid, uh, but also you to have a character that is geared enough to be accepted into a pug group and is willing to suffer through the pugging of that experience. And this is me speaking for like the average player, not necessarily speaking for myself. I know that I could go to Death Jesters or, you know, uh, Zeros to Heroes or a variety of other friends who have raid teams, including Jason's team and go, hey, I want to throw my mop character in with you guys next time you're doing mop stuff. Is this something we could do? And hop in and, and get a regular, you know, sort of group. I'm fortunate in that I have friends uh, who are in a situation where they would be happy to provide me with that experience. But I do feel like we are in a situation where the average player finding a, a heroic raid team currently is difficult, even inside the live game. I, uh, so it, it's a, it's a tricky thing to, uh, to who will accept you. So it's a tricky thing to manage to accomplish that inside of a limited time event. I found I haven't been able to get into normal. I, I did try to get into a normal raid twice and wasn't able to get into a normal raid. Just I don't know if it was eye level wise or class wise or level wise or any kind of restriction like that. But people were just weren't accepting uh, when it came to trying to plug into something like that. And I was like, all right, well, is what it is. But to find out, and this is the this is you know, and I, I I let's let's well, sure, I'll, I'll highlight the positive things first. I like the the glyph system for abilities. I like the experience gain on the cloak. I like the stack gain on the cloak. I like that a lot. Well, some of that carries over to alts. I like that the revisiting of the content, I think, is really special and fun. Um, I think the pacing of the leveling is okay. Uh, I think it obviously will be better with a second character because you're starting at, you know, 100% increased experience on your cloak as opposed to starting at zero. And so I, I feel like the second character is going to feel better than the first when it comes to that. Uh, and and I, I love that the revisioning of the content is something that we could see with other expansions. But immediately I was like, I want this for BFA. I want to go back to BFA in a BFA remix and tear through that content and those zones and what's going on with that. I want this for Legion. I want to have a Legion remix. I want to go back and tear through this content in those zones in this kind of experience. Like I, I immediately felt that way, which is part of why I've been a little bit more vocal when it comes to the criticisms that I have for this content, because I do feel like there's some pretty heavy criticisms that need to be mentioned because they need to improve on it and make it fun. So enough people participate that they do it more than the one time, <laughs> which is what I want. So criticism wise for this content, I do feel like bronze acquisition is a very solved thing. And that's a big problem. I think that when they describe this event as just raining rewards down on players and players should feel very overpowered. Uh, that is a gross generalization of which activities players are participating in. And that's a problem right now for anyone who's curious, if you want to min max your Mr. Pandaria remix experience, 
the best thing you can do is log in every day, do your LFR, do your raid uh, for normal raid, and then go and kill frogs for the rest of your time playing the, the game. If you go and do these things, you will have the fastest power gain with the fastest experience gain for your cloak and the fastest currency gain for your rewards. That it, it literally is, and, and by fastest, I mean like by 400 or 500%, like a crazy increase of fastest over any other activity that you're doing. Uh, it is hugely the best way to do this. And that's a problem. Now, is it a problem that I think they should just go and fix by nerfing this other stuff into the ground? No, I think they should make the other parts of the game catch up to that. Because I feel like from what I'm hearing from people who are doing those things, this is a great experience if you're just trying to get as much currency as possible to earn the rewards you want, get as much power as possible to eventually be able to maybe solo normal or heroic or mythic raid on a character, like just get in there by yourself and just mess stuff up and mix stuff up. That's something that you could potentially do towards the end of this experience if you're someone who is gaining a lot of power like that. So I, I feel like they should be putting more time into helping players achieve that goal through other means. And the biggest one I'm going to highlight is, is just questing in the open world. I'm shocked that after 14.5 hours, I am not max level yet. I am shocked that I don't even have enough currency to buy a mount yet. Like one of the top 10 rare, top rare mounts that they put through into this. I have 18 K bronze. I like, I, I am shocked that that is the pacing that I'm getting through just questing through the zones. That is bizarre to me that that is what they've put together here. And all of the tips that I've gotten from people who are like, dude, you'll enjoy this so much more if is go do the raids. <laughs> it's the number one thing that I get told. Go and do the raids. Each time you do a wing, you get 12% more experience to your cloak off of each normal boss that you kill. You get, you know, the, like, okay, that's great. But like, why can't I earn that type of pacing and progression? out of just questing in this thing. Why is it that every time I finish one of the big chapter achievements for a quest zone, I don't get like 18% more experience and stats and stuff on my cloak? Why is that not a thing that's taking place? Why is it that basically the solved solution is go to these raids and the raids give you such a large boost that you then basically just go and farm these frog creatures, which then give you all the other stuff that you need as far as currency and rewards go. So I, I, I do think, and it's early in, in the event, right? We got like 80 days or 85 days left or whatever it is. So there's going to be plenty of, of opportunity for them to go in and tweak and fix and try and resolve these sorts of things along the way. That's why I want to give this feedback early is what I would want to do with this event. The way that I would want to play this event is take a character, hop into questing, level that character up through questing, take another character, hop into questing, level that character up through questing, and do that with the character classes that I haven't gotten heritage armors for yet, so that I can earn a whole bunch of bronze while I'm doing it and buy the rewards I want, while also leveling a bunch of characters up so that I can have, essentially when this event ends, a bunch of heritage quest lines that I can do they are gonna be really cool and fun to explore and have the rewards that I wanted to purchase. Doesn't seem like that's in the cards <laughs> at all which is part of why I'm losing steam on the whole event. So I, I, they, they need to do some adjustments here to like, that, that's what it was. It was sold as to me as here's a great opportunity for you to feel very overpowered and level characters very quickly. Uh, and it, it isn't that at the moment. Uh, it, it is once you've played enough, I, I think level 60 is when my cloak passed over the 100% experience gain uh, point, uh, which means that basically how, how the cloak works for people who aren't sure is there's achievements associated with powering up your cloak and the cloak that you get on your alts is based upon the achievements that you have accomplished on your main character that you've been playing through and it caps out at 100 percent. so that was the other factor that a lot of people were mixed sort of confused about is you have max level characters who are now at like 300 or 400 percent increased experience gain on their cloak who when you make an alt that alt gets a 100 percent experience gain cloak and they're like well wait a minute i've earned 400 percent on my main What's the point of me continuing to play my main if I'm not actually helping and empowering my cloak for alts? Because it does cap out on secondary stats and primary stats and everything. It all caps out on the cloak based off of achievements. So if you are looking to do what I'm doing, you basically hit that point on your cloak, max your tune out, and then just switch characters because there's no reason to continue playing your main. 
other than, hey, I want to earn more bronze, that's really the only thing, or I want to experience trying to solo some content that is more difficult content down the line. So it's uh, it, I think overall, it's a very cool, spicy game mode. I don't think they went over the top enough with it. And I think that they could really to dial things up for solo player outdoor content in a limited time game mode like this. I just think they could. That's where I'm at with it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I think you make some interesting points there. I do think it is early in the process, and yeah. as far as like the the ramp, the power ramp goes, like it's definitely coming, um, because I, I already saw it last night just going through the stuff I played. Like the power of the group scaled up a lot just in that one session, you know, which is not something that would really happen with the traditional gearing. Um, I do think like regarding the stuff you could buy from vendors, I think there are some straight up traps that are being offered on these vendors because most of this stuff uh, you know by sheer volume is available in the live game uh either from doing you know questing or what have you achievements in pandaria content or from raid drops which are currently on a daily lockout in the live game and so you can farm to your heart's content depending on how many tunes you have above like level 30 and all that stuff when they shut off the daily lockout it is going to be like warband wide so you can bring any character and get any mogs that are you know uh, available add that to your collection and then use it on the appropriate character so i feel like the fact that there's a vendor that offers for five thousand bronze a full mog set of anything from a raid in multiple different difficulties for each class is that's a trap you shouldn't i don't feel like you should spend your bronze on that as a player because it's just not a good value proposition it's not a unique thing it's not going away it's only going to get easier to farm in the future and yet it's on there also a lot of the stuff that drops in the like the stuff that just straight up drops in the raids is the appearances so um I, you know i think there's some stuff that maybe shouldn't be on the vendor they should maybe be kind of directing people more towards unique stuff that is only for this event but that's you know that's just my personal take on it sure and, sure. I, I, and that's part of the reason why i'm like i there's a lot of stuff on here that i just don't care about you know i i might i think my problem going forward is going to be like i don't know why i care about anything on offer here you know and, and you mentioned the tusks and like i went and looked at the tusks right away and the tusks are like 38 and a half K, which is fine. But you also need 20 tokens that drop from normal or heroic garage. Do I really want to do Siege of Orgrimmar 20 times inside this content? All the, or at least 20 garage kills? I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like it right now. Maybe yeah. I end up there by mid August, but at the moment, like that's, I think that's off the table for me. Cause I just don't want to play the game that way necessarily. Yeah. If I get it cool, but it's, you know, it's not going to be, a thing that is like front and center for me. I'm not, I'm not gunning for that. I mean, I think the cool thing is though, like the bronze acquisition and stuff does scale up quite fast at max level. And especially because you get so much gear dropped on you. That is that you're then scrapping and all that stuff scales up quite a bit as well. So like that is, that is nice. And the way the tinker gem, like really the biggest thing with the power I I'm seeing is that the way the tinker gems interact in a, in a raid group, you know, where you have, everybody's got all these tinker gems and their builds are just super uh, uh complimentary and then people are stacking like one particular effect or something you know it's 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 actually pretty cool and it, it results in some bosses just getting exploded um but there's some technique to it and it's a little bit weird right it's it's like way beyond what we're used to with like setting up a character in this game so um, I'm sure there's going to be more combos and stuff discovered that are like, okay, do this and then watch what happens, which is cool. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think touch, overall, like, but before we like move the, on, I, I want to, I want to touch on the transmog yeah. com comment. So before we move too far past it, um, yes, collecting transmog absolutely available in live game. Yes. Daily lockout at the moment, uh, is something that exists. And yes, we know that with war bands coming in, everything will become account wide. So if you're getting plate drops on one character, hang on to them because they'll count towards your war band once you actually have all that go live. So that's certainly worth keeping in mind when it comes to that sort of thing. They currently do have transmog sets for the open world sets and some of the like low level dungeon sets that are in that like 500 to 750 kind of range for tokens which to me makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, I'm with you that I don't understand why the raid sets cost 5,000. I think that is a massive, ridiculous, bad jump. Uh, it's just a poor decision between the cost of a, a like normal outdoor world set and then a raid set. 
uh i i think well, especially because like the stuff just drops in the raids like i don't yeah, yeah it's very weird it, i i it's very weird to offer that for 5k so so that's like again where i would say all right I think they should be either revisiting the cost of everything that's inside of the shops, or they should be revisiting the earn rate of bronze from activities that don't involve jumping into some large group content that is going on inside of this particular content, just because that's not the majority of your player base who are, who are doing this. Uh, I, I cannot expect that the average player is going to go to Wowhead and look at their best gem guide and what their spec should be and how to earn currency the best for them. Uh, that is just a totally unreasonable expectation to put onto a player base. I'd, I'm willing to bet probably a lot of player base don't even know you can hop into raids below max level because it's such been such a standardized thing where you need to be max level in order to do end game content that there's probably a lot of players out there who are like, wait a minute, I can hop into normal raid while I'm leveling and get more stuff from that while I'm leveling. Like, I think that's probably the reaction that a lot of players will have here, which... I, I, I don't blame players for <laughs> at all. This is a, a unique experience and they haven't done a very good job of communicating a lot of this stuff out there. And unfortunately, the best way to to earn your rewards and progress is doing things that are massive group content and then monotonous farming, <laughs> which is not ideal <laughs> when it comes to this sort of event. So, Oh, yeah. man. You, you were cutting close to the bone of what World of Warcraft actually is there, which is... <laughs> maybe all the thing like massive group content and the, the tedious outdoors like I mean, that is it, sort it is, of it, I, it, there's it is an for, argument to be made that just is the game well no no so so it is for some people right and I, the, the people so this is like this is a story i've told a few times on the show but i haven't told it in a long time uh when i first met robin she was playing it was burning crusade uh and the way that she was playing the game was just running around fishing that's what she enjoyed doing she just enjoyed going to different zones fishing one day she hopped on a boat and the boat left the harbor and it went, hey, sorry, you cannot do this content because you haven't purchased Burning Crusade and dumped her into the water. And so she went, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll need to buy whatever this thing is so I can go to wherever this boat goes because I want to go where this boat goes. So she bought, you know, Burning Crusade. And so she went off and did the Burning Crusade content stuff and enjoyed that for a while, but doing that again by going around fishing. And I was at the time, you know, competing for top 100 world rating kind of gaming playing and so when we realized that we both had played world of warcraft in the past and decided to hop in and play together uh one of the first thing i things i noticed was she was wearing a very large she was playing a druid wearing a very large mix of uh intellect gear and agility gear and using agility weapons but playing a spec for a boomkin and you're like okay because there was nothing in the game at the time back in those days that communicated, hey, this is, <laughs> there's no like pre-built spec for you or guiding you on itemization for your character or anything like that that's built into the game. So, you know, I sort of immediately was like, well, I mean, we got to fix this. So we'll get you this gear and do this and we can get you into dungeons and do that. She'd never done group content before at that point. She'd leveled up by just sort of being out in the world doing stuff that she did out in the world. This is to me... The way I have to like continuously bring my brain back to from my mythic rating kind of perspective. Okay, here's where there is a large, very large group of player base that plays the game without doing group content, out in the world, experiencing story, enjoying the, the world for themselves. And that to them is what the big game is. It's really easy to go, yeah, the, all, the game is entirely just, hey, big group content and then do the grind to power up your character. And as soon as you're done the grind to power up your character, you're pretty much just doing group content and then logging, right? Very easy to, for me to think that way. That's not how the large majority of players play this game. <laughs> so I need to like, I always have to bring myself back into check and remember that moment where you're like, oh, okay. The outdoor world, as you said, is the character. A lot of people just enjoy exploring the outdoor world and experiencing that content. This needs to be an incredibly viable, if not the best way to accomplish things in this game in, in a lot of ways. Yes, there can be unique gear pieces and upgrades and, and the top end gear can come from the, the really challenging group content. Totally fine with that. But when we get a limited time event for Mists of Pandaria and leveling is like the fourth best way to do something, as, as far as out being outdoor world questing is like the fourth best way to do something, that's a big problem, in my opinion. It should be the best way to do something. 
doing quests at, at, yeah. with with groups and going out and exploring the zones with groups and exploring the quest chains with groups that should be the best way to do something when that content dries up because it does you can get through all of the questing in mr pandaria in like 20 hours it's not really that huge of a thing like all of it including side quests in that period of time uh i think at that point it should be like okay here's raids and everything else that starts sort of kicking in after that for a limited time event like this i, I just it's it's unfortunate to me that we're in a situation where there's so many better ways to earn the rewards and to progress your character than just exploring the outdoor world of the expansion and the quest chains and stories they have to tell yeah i mean i think that outside of the like the busted frog farming that they should have not allowed to occur i don't really think that the gap is that wide i think the I think the biggest thing with MOP Remix is the right way to play it is just to have fun with whatever is fun to you and like not worry about this stuff. But we're WoW players, so it becomes a thing of like, dude, you're not min-maxing, you're not optimizing your time in Remix, dude. Like, you're 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 missing out on all this stuff. Like, I mean, I did almost nothing but questing up to 70, and I had a great time. I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. I was talking to people who were like, well, I'm going to do LFR. And then they're sitting in queues, or they're not getting normal raid invites, and they're not actually progressing their character because they're trying to get this bonus to progress their character later. I have what time I have to play, you know what I mean? And so I had the time to do it, and so that's what I did, and I, I, I thought it was fine. Um, I think, you know, one cool thing about the structure is that if the, the reward structure is a double-edged sword because everything gives some version of the same rewards, right? There's like some scale that it scales up around a little bit, depending on what you're actually doing, but you're getting gems and bronze and this very generic gear with sockets and that's pretty cool like you can you can do like a scenario or like a daily quest or something and get something that's going to power you up no matter what other content you're doing i think the problem is like the appeal of that for me seems to be flattening out already and it's like day four you know what i mean <laughs> Like, True. There's sure. only, I, there's only so much power I feel like I need that I actually benefit from, and the rest is like, okay, well, what do does, do people want to play? What do we want to do? You know what I mean? Um, there's also like you have to do the we don't have to, but if you want to get all the jewelry and everything, you have to do various questing campaigns like the stuff that got added in the patches. Yeah. And from I haven't started any of that yet, but it sounds kind of awkward because some of that stuff like landfall rolled out over time, so you got one quest a week or every other week or whatever it was. And now it's like kind of repetitive because you have all these quests like all in a row that you can play through all at once that are just sending you back and forth to the same places. So some of that stuff doesn't really translate in this format, Sure. Um, which is just, I mean, like, what are they going to do? Redevelop the whole game? Like, no, this is something to keep us occupied until War Within comes out. But um, I mean, I think there's a lot of cool ideas and a lot of the Tinker Gem designs are really interesting and fun and powerful. Um, I think, you know, I think for the whole thing to really end up hanging together for me, I don't think it would be possible actually thinking about it now and like ha having played what I played for it to be something that really scratches my itch. It isn't that because there isn't the top end of the, of the experience, you know, there's not the, the really topping out with, with the character power, with the traditional gear acquisition and sort of the, the difficulty yeah. ramping. So, you know, what, whatever, I think it'll be a cool distraction for me and just, kind of you know pick it up and when people want to play do done i mean i think heroic dungeons are going to be super fun to do they're great dungeons in, in this in this expansion and um they're pretty lucrative so that's pretty fun for a small group you know if you get a really small group you got scenarios and stuff there's plenty of variety which is cool and um it does it's it's unfortunate i think the the, the timeless isle thing has soured a lot of people because it's like they're they're seeing people who took advantage of that and just skyrocketed their power and going I'll never be able to catch up to that, which might be true. It's a weird but ca I, catch. Catching up is a weird objective right, like, to have. Like I agree. when I think yes. about it, it's like I don't. I don't. If somebody did that and they're just like super OP, like I don't care. There's not like leaderboards yeah. for this stuff. Yeah. There's no. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just not. It's not a competitive thing to me. And there's not. There's well, part of it, I guess, is that there really is no endpoint that I'm shooting for. So. You know, I don't really care what anybody else is doing, I right. guess. So there's, I have nothing to even compare myself against because I'm just along for the ride. So I, it's it, it's a little weird. Like, I, I think some of the stuff works a lot differently than I thought it was going to. And some of that is really good and some of that is really, I don't want to say bad, but it's weird or like not, it's like against the grain of what I'm really looking for. Sure. And, and I don't think anyone should be focused on other people's progression in a limited time event like this. That's not what the objective for this is at all. But I do think that 
people who are looking at people who are very overpowered like that. I think everyone should be overpowered like that in this. I think they should have just made all of the activities that you could participate in as rewarding as the frogs are. And so everyone was just feeling that way right now. I, I just do. I think this could have been an experience where you were gaining, as opposed to gain 4% experience or 7% experience gained for completing quests, you were gaining 20. I, like, I think that would have been fine. And they would have had people just cranking through levels and cranking through power and... I think when you hit 70, being able to just walk into a heroic raid and solo heroic raid would have been really cool. And it would have helped a lot of players have a really engaging, fun experience and crazy experience with this whole thing. That's unfortunate. That's not what it is. It it has turned into something else. And uh, it's we'll have to see how it plays out over time, right? What they choose to do, what players' experiences are. I know the forums are lit up with all kinds of controversial feedback. So I'm curious as to where this all leads when it all gets down to it. Yeah. But well, I mean, this is why it's an experiment, and this is why it's yeah. time limited, right? Yeah. It's not. This is a. This is like a side uh, project, and I think it's cool that they have the leeway to do that now. They have the flexibility, and they have the bandwidth. They can do stuff like this in Plunderstorm, where it's like, okay, we're gonna try something really out there, and some of you're gonna like it, and some of you're gonna hate it, but you know, we're gonna keep chugging along. I think it's that's definitely a win for us either way, because even if you don't like this, I'll bet you something comes out of this eventually that makes you like something in the mainline game or Agreed. something like that. Yes, you know? It's a great experiment for sure. Yeah. Okay. With that, let's talk about what's going on this week in World of Warcraft. All right, this week in World of Warcraft is the Arena Skirmish bonus event, where Sun and Skirmisher buff is up, increasing honor gains from Arena Skirmishes by 50%, and there's a quest to win 10 of them, rewarding some conquest and honor, if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, we also have PV the PvP brawl Gravity Lapse taking place, which is Eye of the Storm, where gravity turns off once every minute, and people can sort of swim around in the sky, and then they plummet down, and you hope you haven't walked over top of something you shouldn't have and are getting yourself hurt. It also lets people traverse flags in interesting ways, time out different uh, strategies based off of this gravity lapse. If that's something you're interested in doing, feel free to check that out. There's also the something different quest you get for winning one of these, where you uh, get some marks of honor, conquest, and honor along with those rewards. We have a world boss that is awakened this week. The Zuccali Elders down inside Zerla Caverns are up and awakened. That means they're dropping 499 eye level loot. For folks who are interested in hopping down there and getting yourself some upgrades, be sure you're knocking out these Akeli Elders. When it comes to Mythic Plus, we have Tyrannical, Volcanic, and Sanguine. Our bosses have more health and deal increased damage. While in combat, enemies periodically cause gouts of flame to erupt beneath the feet of distant players. And when slain, non-boss enemies leave behind a lingering pool of ichor that heals their allies and damages players. I think this is going to be a good week for Tyrannical, personally. Yes, I think Sanguine will make Trash go a little bit more funky and slow. The pools don't last as long as they used to. And you got to remember, Sanguine is the thing that kicks in last, Aphex-wise. You might not even be doing keys where you experience Sanguine at all. In which case, it's a volcanic Tyrannical week, which sounds great to me. Because <laughs> uh, not only, even if you had Sanguine, does Sanguine factor in on bosses? It doesn't, so that's great. There's no kind of sync up there. Volcanic is fairly easy to manage and usually only affects one to two players of a group. So as long as those one to two players are used to stepping out of the way of the fire pools that happen on the ground so they don't get launched into the air, you are golden. This is probably one of the best Tyrannical weeks you'll find when it comes to something like that. Uh, so yeah, I think you should get in there and enjoy some Tyrannical. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is a this is a good combo. This is a complete opposite of the last couple of weeks. Um, none of this stuff is comp dependent at all. Everybody can move out of a volcanic. Um, everybody can, you know, kite a mob out of a sanguine puddle. I mean, obviously, if you have death grip or uh, ring of peace or something, that's better than not having it. But you don't really need that to deal with sanguine. And yeah, the retune sanguine is a lot more favorable to players. Like it, like you said, it only lasts like twenty seconds. It used to be a full yeah. minute, I think. And yeah. um, also, I mobs used to be able to stand in multiple and it would stack. Um, now it's like they're either in or out of it, so that helps too. It's also not a fortified week, so Sanguine is like percent healing, so these mobs have like way less health to begin with, and then they're healing less overall when they're in it. It still sucks. Like you want to pay attention to <laughs> it, it right? Like, yes. like you don't you don't want to have a mob just like chilling in this, healing forever. Yeah, but like you want, you want your it, knockbacks and your interrupts and everything else to get them out of it for sure. Yeah, you're just but you're not gonna have those instances where you lost three minutes on a timer because of bad sanguine play, you know. Yeah. Um volcanic is pretty favorable, you know, it's just something that uh, range players are going to need to be aware to step out of 
Um, it's not super dangerous. It can be disruptive, but it's not like it's going to kill you in most situations, I guess. Like, if it knocks you up in the air and then you land lower than you started from, then, you know, you might take a, a significant amount of fall damage. But, um, you know, tyrannical is tyrannical. You know, the bosses are going to be hard, and we are still pretty early in the season. I feel like... You know, some dungeons that are feeling harder to me are like Neltharis, for example. I think the bosses in there are pretty challenging and the timer is very tight. Um, so that's actually good for a tyrannical week because you can move through the trash quickly, but then your boss execution has to be on point or you won't make the timer, you know. Uh, Ruby Life Pools is another one. I think the bosses are a bit harder there. Um, just, you know, it, also the overall layout can make it really complicated to have a clean run. So. Some of those could be harder, but I think something like Algathar Academy, for example, is emerging as one of the easier dungeons overall in this pool. Um, you have some huge pulls in there, though, so you're going to have, you know, potentially a lot of Sanguine dropping. So, you know, just some things to consider. Overall, I think it'll be a fine week. And I mean, yeah, if you're just in it for like the plus eights, then you don't even have Sanguine. And uh, I think you'd be feeling pretty good. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm hoping I'm hoping that we keep the momentum up. I would love to get... I'm going to miss a, a night this week, which is going to put me really behind on, on crest farming, but maybe I can strong arm some people into doing keys with me. You know, because I I think, actually, um, this the with this current tuning and in this current season, it's really sort of brought me around on a lot of these dungeons. I think these are actually great dungeons. And uh, the, the Dragonflight content, I think this season really puts a shine on it. You know, I, it's, it's made me feel better about it than I have, I, I guess, like, just not really thinking too much about it, you know, like in season three, for example, like, I, I wouldn't say like, oh, this pool is going to be really fun. I, in fact, I probably said the complete opposite, but um, I think it's come out really well. I'm, I'm enjoying the, the keys and um, this is going to be a great week if you haven't really gotten in there yet or you're still like pushing something up, you're shooting for a rating threshold or whatever. Um, just know your boss strats and, and get in there. Yeah, for sure. I think this is a really good week for those looking to push some stuff with Tyrannical and that business. We have an upcoming micro-holiday Glowcap Festival. Speaking of uh, Burning Crusade earlier, uh, yes, that is taking place uh, and it runs Monday, May 27th. Basically, you can head to Sporogar in Zangermarsh and collect some rare mushrooms to help the Sporlings heal their great mushroom Fashu. Got to help out Fashu whenever you can. You'll gain a bit of Sporgar reputation for helping them out. This was also one of the first events in World of Warcraft that actually gave healers something that they could do uh, as a healer inside of an event. You could actually use your healing spells to help top off the fallen Sporg Sporlings, and then they were able to like get up and essentially you earn progression towards completion of the quests and goals and objectives in this. So that was really cool, and I wish they did that more often with more quests. We do still find them here and there, even... One of the early quests in War Within Alpha is one where you're healing people up and you can do this, which I think is great. So I'm glad that they keep that included as wherever they can. It would just be cool to see a little bit more role-specific questing where there's a bit more benefit to it than, hey, if you can kill these things really fast, congratulations, that's the best thing you need to do and fastest way to quest. But that uh, being said, if you want to go help Fashu, get out there to Zanger Marsh on the 27th and help out your big friendly mushroom peoples. Yeah, and this is one of the few micro holidays where, you know, yeah, you do actually get like a permanent benefit if you aren't maxed on Sporogar rep. If you go do this, you do get. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's probably not like the best way to do that, but most micro holidays are just like, well, do this if you want to, but there's nothing else you really get other than the satisfaction of participating in it. Um, yeah. You do get rep from this, you know, if that's one of the reps that you don't have maxed out. So that's another little incentive to go check it out. Indeed. All right, so as far as hot fixes go for the live game, the Dragonflight game, veteran and champion track items, uh, including rings and necklaces obtained from outdoor activities, are now eligible for conversion with Revival Catalyst or, respectively, adding sockets to them. Uh, both these fixes are retroactive, so anything you find in the outdoor world should now count along those proper upgrade tracks, as well as getting either Revival Catalyst or socketed based off of what type of item it is. They also fix this in, is yeah, excellent, this, by the way, because yeah. there's been a weird there's a weird split the first couple of weeks where certain activities would give you a 480, but 
you know, or like two different activities would give you a 480, and one of them would be catalyzable and the other one would not. And the distinction between that could be confusing. And like also, you'd have to remember where an item came from. You yeah. know, if you just go to the catalyst and you're like, I want yeah. to convert this, well, I could do this 480, but not that 480. Like, yeah. th there was no way to really tell it apart. Um, I think as long as it's veteran track, which is like LFR equivalent, then it should be fair game. So uh, that's a good change. Um, I'm not really sure, like, if you would want to put like, well, I guess if you, you have if you have a necklace and you want to buy the sockets, then, you know, that's probably good. I'm not sure that like veteran items are really a good target. The value for your, is there. Yeah, for, yeah like if, if if you're using like the, the token of merit to buy a socket, I, I don't know if I put that on a veteran thing or not, because you could even get champ track stuff from weekly events. Right. So, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But. I mean, whatever. It's uh, all the stuff should be upgradable and socketable and and whatever. I think. I mean, anything above explorer track should be fair game, in my opinion. Yeah, I I get just for consistency, throwing veteran track stuff into the socketable items. I am with you that I don't think I would spend that unique currency putting something into a veteran track item. I think I would certainly look for something higher before I invested something like that into a socketing an item. So. I mean, we also live in the in the world of bullion, right? So yes, like your <laughs> you, like your rings and necklace, like you can get an awaken track thing if you play for a couple of weeks and you know do some LFR or what have you. Yeah. And so yeah, I would I would save it for that. But you know, if you want to put it in your veteran, you can. Yep. They also fixed an issue with the roster move transformation requiring level seventy. Obviously, this would also be something that affected WoW, the WoW uh, Pandaria Remix because you get Dragon Riding and Pandaria Remix, which, by the way, dramatically changes the experience of that expansion because the entire expansion was one that people right off the bat were like, I wish we had flying right away. And we actually had the devs come out and say, no, we wanted everyone to experience at least the majority of these zones from a ground perspective because they're so we put so much effort and they're so beautiful that we wanted people to experience that and didn't want to get them flying right away. So <laughs> you're getting not just flying, but dragon riding right away inside of Bop Remix. Uh, it definitely trivializes <laughs> some of that experience, um, but it uh, it is super enjoyable and and also does not require you to own Dragonflight. If you're someone who doesn't own Dragonflight and you're like, hey, I want to just check out Missa Pandaria Remix, you can and you will have dragon riding that you can also experience without having to own uh, the uh, the miss the uh, dragon riding, dragon flight expansion. So that is another uh, another big thing that's pretty cool. All right, as far as uh, the community council goes, there is a question about loadouts and talent loadouts are that nice fun feature in the bottom left corner of your talents that allow you not only to save what you're currently looking at, but also to be able to load or import other builds, including some of the starter builds that they've defaulted in for folks. We want to just hop in and uh, and not really worry about how they're specking their characters. So this is a reply to why is there a cap on talent loadouts from WoW software engineer Jan and uh, or JM. I'm not sure whether that's a ya or a J, but we'll find out. Uh, thank you very much. Feel free to let us know or correct us. Great question. We store these talent loadouts on the server so that you have access to them on any device you log in on. However, because we're persisting this data. This is one of the many parts of the game services where we need to be mindful of storage requirements. It may not feel like a lot, but all of these talent, these save talent builds across all of your characters in WoW really add up. So we have to be intentional about even small additions to the memory footprint of a character. Fortunately, for players who want to save more information than we allow on the server side, there are add-ons let them they'll let you save and manage many loadouts locally uh, to a device. Also, good news, we periodically discuss topics like this, review historical player data on, on how features are being used, and take into account player feedback, just like this thread. In one of our upcoming alpha builds, we're going to increase the number of talent loadouts available. So FYI, yes, they are increasing the amount of talent loadouts, which is pretty cool, but also just thinking about the back end of like, yeah, even if this is like a, I don't know, 500 character text string, uh, to be able to save a, a loadout, a full loadout build for someone. It could be less than that, even if it's a 200 character. Each of those are individual files that are saved that are 0 0.01 kilobytes in size. And if you have 100 of them across 50 characters, 60 characters, because we're going to be increasing that number, 
you can eventually add up to a huge amount of data storage for 7 million, 6 million players. I'm just saying, it's, you know, something they have to be mindful of. And they have to be mindful of what the overall cap of that is, right? Even if you're like, oh, well, not everyone's going to have 60 characters. Like, come on. You're like, sure, but there's the potential that that could happen. And so they need to actually account for the potential that that could happen. And that's, you know, one of the factors that, that goes into it. Now, I'm, I also found something that I do a lot because uh, I'm big on backing things up is if I come, out, come across a talent build I really like, I will just do a, a, an export and then just save that string instead of a text file and email it to myself. And then it just sits in my email or a Dropbox or your OneDrive or whatever it is you want to put it on, right? Your Apple Drive. It could just sit on any of those things and you go, hey, regardless of where I am or what's happening, I have this build if I want it. Uh, even if it wasn't server side or something broke or something went wrong or I lost all of them. Cause I always have that like fear of having to re restart from scratch on rebuilding something like that. And I'm actually thrilled that this is save server side because your WTF folder stuff isn't that sits on your local. And so if you delete your WTF folder inside of your world of Warcraft, you know, file configuration, uh, you essentially lose all of your macros all of the settings for how your UI is set up, like all of that goes away, which is a, a, a in my opinion, something that I wished was cloud-based for a long time. <laughs> I would love if they would be willing to store that kind of data, but those files are very large and I understand why they don't. It's just one of the cases of, you know, I I, I can respect where the engineer is coming from with this. And I, I'm honestly surprised that they chose to save talent builds uh, as something like that, those huge amount of profiles is something that's cloud-based because they've been very restrictive about that up till now. Like, they don't even save your macros. Like you're, you have a limited number of macros that you can have, and they are literally one string text lines <laughs> in most cases, and they don't even save those for you. Those are all local. So yeah, I think that's something that's worth keeping in mind as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool uh, kind of series of posts here because they were spread out over like, uh, I guess a couple of weeks, sort of the stealth announcement of like, oh, more talent builds coming. But, you know, I, I think Blizzard doesn't ever want to get out in front of stuff and go, yeah, there's like a tech issue here, you know, like they don't want to they don't want to kind of get into that with with players, with customers when it comes to a lot of this stuff. But, you know, there are tech limitations to what they could do with WoW. And the thing is the there's there's some degree of stuff that feels kind of seamless between what's local and what's server side. Um, you kind of just log in and play. You don't really think about it, right? And so that, but then it can be kind of incongruous when you're like, well, why can't I make a new talent loadout on my character? But wait, this is a different spec or whatever. Like, can't I just make a thing? And but no, there is actually like a cap on how much of that stuff they're willing to store for your account. So you know that kind of falls into that category but um, it is it's cool that um, you know we're bumping this up a bit. I mean, this is going to be really uh, I'm sure helpful for people who like to play multiple different uh, specs in different types of content. You can yeah. have your, you know, your Resto Raid and Resto M Plus and Balance Raid and Balance M Plus and Outdoor World and whatever else. And, um, you know, I, I I really have like three builds that I rotate through, but I only play one spec. But even the, like, what what's the total that you could have on your character? Like five? So, um, you know, I'm, I play one spec and I'm already using most of that, right? So I, um, it's, it's cool that they're able to continue to, you know, expand on, on these kind of systems and just provide more of that. I, it's, I mean, it makes sense why they limited it, especially with this being a relatively new implementation since yeah. uh, 2022. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was kind of a, a funny way to uh, kind of announce that, you know, not really, not really like a big announcement, but just a little diamond in the rough there. Like, Hey, we're getting, we're getting uh, more storage for that. It would be interesting if they offered an extra one dollar or something on someone's subscription if they wanted them to cloud to, to basically buy cloud storage <laughs> to go hey i want you to store my keybind profiles my you know macro stuff my uh ui settings that i have like all you know that your your do you want auto loot or whatever on like all that stuff gets saved like all of those things make, across like, every drive. instance yeah. Subscribe to Battle Drive. Battle Drive. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like I don't know. It, it's just, it'd be interesting yeah. to me to to see if they would consider something like that, or like not even not even a pay service, but like just consider doing that eventually at some point, because that is the biggest 
frustration I find when you have to essentially reinstall World of Warcraft and you've lost and you didn't save your WTF folder or whatever it was is losing all of those finite little changes that you've made yeah. over the years uh, of playing the game. That you're like, oh, you know what? Having you know the the graphic settings set just this particular way, or having uh, my essentially uh, UI set up just a pretty you know the UI scale is set a certain percentage or whatever it is that you're doing to be like something doesn't feel right when you're playing the game inside another instance of the game. And sometimes it never gets all the way back it there, and your brain there. is just yeah. itchy forever. And yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've been there a few times over the years. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Anyways, we're going to move on from Dragonflight to talk a little bit about War Within Alpha because uh, we have some development updates for that. Uh, starting off here, the new allied race Earthen is actually now available. You can get in and do their introductory quest line and test that out. So if you're somebody who wants to try out some Earthen, you can get in there and do that. The cla the hero talents for Totemic with Shaman is now available as well, where essentially they went in and went, hey, Totemic now excels at unlocking the full power of their totems, strengthening their totems and gaining access to new ones. They have honed their imbuement skills to further improve their combat capabilities. So if you're an enhancement or restoration Shaman, you can now try out your Totemic setup. I'm excited to look at what this is. I really am because it's such a passive power increase in a lot of cases with totems that I I want to know what they're laying out for this man. So I'm going to I'm going to dig into a shaman and see what this all lines up as cuz it sounds cool. Like I'm I'm down for I want my totem wagon too though. There better be a totem wagon somewhere gotta, in here. <laughs> got to bring back the old vanilla totem bar and yep. micromanagement and all that. I I don't think they're doing that. No. I haven't I haven't I haven't played uh this alpha build as you might expect and yep. I I haven't checked out shaman but um yeah, this is you know, they're I I say this every week. I'm not sure what's left that isn't in there yet, but they're, yep. you know, they're ticking them off the list. So we're getting a build every week and we're getting new hero talents to, to check out. So that's cool. I mean, uh, we, we've seen a lot of updates already just in the little yep. while it's been up. And we saw even more updates to your favorite mountain thing came in here. Yes. I wanted to highlight some changes that are in this build, um, not because they have any huge impact on potentially whatever is going to be shipping or whatever, but um, there's a couple updates that they made. Um, Strength of the Mountain they updated, which was a hero talent that increased shield slam damage. Um, they made it not increase it so much, but they made it also now have an effect where Demo Shout reduces uh, damage that enemies deal to you by an additional 5%. Um, they, they reworked some talents and uh, sort of, th there were a couple talents in the tree that were really just sort of flat tuning bonuses, essentially. Um, and they're adjusting them to like add additional effects or a bit more interactivity. And, um, I want to highlight this because I specifically provided some feedback about some of these hero talents that have been changed. Um, I'm not saying that like they did this because I asked them to, but I'm sure they heard other people who had similar kind of feedback that I did. And it's cool to see them pivot on it this early in the process. I just submitted the feedback maybe a week or two ago because I, you know, I think hero talents should be really cool and evocative of the class fantasy and whatever they're kind of leaning into and stuff like I'm using a hero talent so that shield slam does 20% more damage. That's all this hero talent does. This is what a hero talent is. You know, you could just buff shield slam damage by 20% in a hot face. So yeah, that was sort of the kind of feedback that I was saying was like, I love the fantasy of the mountain thing and sort of the, the, the synergy with the lightning strikes and this whole thing. And I want the hero talents to be cool and evocative and, more interactive than just flat stat bonuses. So, um, you know, they, I mean, a lot of these are still sort of in that lane. And I mean, you would expect there would be some, but I think, um, you know, they they are, it was cool to see them pivot on, on these like very quickly after the, you know, they sort of put these talents in and, and gave people a chance to test them and play around with them and submit some feedback. So. It's cool. I, I think the Mountain Thane overall vibe is awesome. I love it. I, it'll be, I, I feel like it's going to be really fun to play with in multi-target situations. And, you know, I, I don't think it's fun to have a hero, a hero talent tree where you're just kind of ticking off these kind of boring, just flat bonuses to your stats. So pretty cool to see that come through this week. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm definitely excited to see a lot of these changes and a lot of the feedback getting adapted right away for players. So that's, that's exciting. It, it, Reminded me, I was watching a YouTube short the other day of someone who basically had a developer in their chat while they were streaming a game and a, a, an actual item was broken. And the developer's like, just give me a second. And like literally 
eight or 10 seconds later, you watch a live hotfix go up and suddenly the item worked, right? And you're like, wow, holy crap. The developers can do that. They have that power of like, this button doesn't feel really good. I, I wish you could change it by like, you know, 20% or something. They're like, all right, here you go. It's changed by 20%. Oh, wow. Actually, yeah, that, that feels great. Thank you. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> Man, I gave feedback. They listened. This happened. That's wonderful. Yeah. So uh, we did see some updates happen to Mountain Day and I was glad to see those get highlighted in there. As far as the user interface and accessibility goes, the functionality of the spellbook has has been added to the, sorry, the search functionality has been added to the spellbook. This is actually something I was looking for in Mop Remix. I was like, wait a minute. Where is this passive ability? I know it's in here somewhere because I see it inside the monk talent tree. I have not, I, I'm not aware of what hit combo was doing in the live game because I hadn't played Monk this expansion and I wanted to know what their whole hit combo thing was about because they have like seven talents that affect hit combo. <laughs> and so I was like, where is it inside of this, you know, skill book going back and forth through the spell book trying to find them? A search feature is wonderful. I did find it and figured it all out, which is cool. It's actually a neat ability and makes me kind of want to play Windwalker Monk. So that's the thing. Uh, but yes, so they've, they've added that search, uh, feature. They've also had exact name matches, uh, for the text search as well as related matches and just name matches in general and description matches spells whose description partially match the text will also come up, which is kind of as well. So you just put in like uh, punch or something like that. Everything associated with the word punch and that has punch in it, or is the word punch will pop up and you'll be able to see all of those associated with it. So you can kind of filter things down, which I think is great. The uh, checkbox was also added to hide passives from displaying in the spellbook. So if you're someone who's like, look, I, I get it. Uh, I have these passive abilities. They just kind of clutter things up. I only want to see my abilities that I can actually move onto a bar so that I know that I have all the stuff on my bar that I want, even though they have added the feature where the thing lights up if it's not on a bar somewhere. Maybe it's on like your shift scroll wheel bar number seven or something. And so it's not lighting up for you. You can you can actually filter out the passwords and make it easier to find things. So keep that in mind as well. Good little features added in there. Really cool if you're just trying to like set up bars quickly on, yep. especially like an alt or something, something that maybe you don't really know how to play and you just want to mess with it, you know, because the passwords are just there. You can't do anything about it anyway. So you just kind of get them out of your face yeah. and then you can figure out how you want your bars set up. So that's kind of a, that's kind of a cool little, uh, little upgrade there. I mean, I've been, I spent a lot of time the last month or so in there in spell books and whatever, moving stuff around, trying to set up bars because I made like three or four new characters on Alpha. Yeah. So every time it was like, okay, what, where did this go? Oh, this turns into whatever spell at what level. Okay, it goes here now. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, we are getting a big overhaul to the spell book, which is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, it's a bit controversial. I don't think everybody loves it, I, but I don't think it's too bad. It's just huge. Well, um, so there is going to so... be, I think, a, a scalable size that you can do to this, which is the other thing they haven't mm -hmm. added yet. As they mentioned, I believe at some point, it's like stuck in my head that they're going to add a way for you to change the size of the spell book on your screen. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that I don't I don't know if it's implemented. Like I said, I had no time to play this. Yeah. This, this build was not on my radar this week. Um, but yeah, like, you know, th there's kind of an ongoing overhaul to uh, to the spell book and to finding all that stuff so you could set your bars up anyway. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, having more options to just filter stuff out is pretty nice. Yeah. All right. We're going to shift away and move into the world of classic for everyone's awareness. So Cataclysm Classic goes live today. It goes live this afternoon uh, or this evening, depending on where you are. 3 p.m. Pacific time uh, or 6 p.m. Eastern time. That is worldwide you're going to be able to explore seven new zones, nine new dungeons, three new raids. And I use the word new knowing that it is only new to people who have only been playing classic up to this point. These are classic existing things, right? So you're still getting Black Rock Taverns, Throne of Tides, Vortex Pinnacle, Stone Core, Lost City of Tolvir, Halls of Origination, Grim Batol, Dead Mines, and Shadowfang Keep as your nine dungeons. You are still getting Throne of the Four Winds, Darkwing, Dis uh, sorry, Darkwing, Darkwing Duck, no, uh, Blackwing Descent, and Bastion of Twilight as your three new raids, as well as uh, obviously Mount Hyjal, Vashir, ugh, Twilight Highlands, Uldum, Deepholm, Kazan, and Gilneas as your seven new zones. So as with Tolbarad, of course, being a, a PvP one for people to get out there and hop in and check it out. You also get flying in Eastern Kingdoms in Kalimdor with this Cataclysm content. You get to fly around back in the old classic content. So a lot of people will be diving in, checking that stuff out. 
Uh, we know that Cas uh, Cla Cataclysm Classic provides uh, the, those new zones, dungeons, and stuff beginning today at, at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific, like I said. And on May 28th, it's also going to introduce the start of a new PvP season, followed by the opening of three raid dungeons on May 30th at, uh, at 6 p.m. Eastern. So next, I guess, 10 days from now, you will see uh, the, the three raid dungeons open up. And you can take a journey into the shattered lands and plumb the depths of this classic experience, of what this classic experience has to offer. Uh, so be sure that you're checking out all the fun stuff around Cataclysm. I know a lot of people who are excited for this. I know people who are like, okay, where am I spending my WoW time, right? All right, I got, I got, I'm going to do Dragonflight Season 4. That's what I'm doing. And then I'm going to pick Cataclysm as my other thing. That's what I'm hearing a lot of people. They're all talking about one other thing that they're going to try and put focus into, right? Okay, I'm, okay, I'm doing, I'm doing Mop Remix and I'm doing Cataclysm Classic. That's where I'm going to focus on things. You're like, okay, cool. Good for you. Like anyone can divide their time however they want to divide the time. That's totally cool. But I know a lot of people who are excited for Cataclysm Classic. Uh, it's not something I'm super excited or going to be engaged in. There's a lot of other stuff pulling my attention at the moment around the game. So I'll probably still stay focused on Dragonflight, Mop, and then the season of Discovery Raid Logging that I'm doing, which we'll get into in a moment, because it sounds like we'll be doing that for a lot longer. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it, it is definitely a release that we wanted to highlight as far as Cataclysm Classic goes for players who want to hop in there and check out this content and dive into some of those zones and see what the world looks like after Deathwing has shattered a lot of these places. You know, I, I hope <laughs> everyone got all their screenshots of Stormwind that they wanted to get. Well, I mean, you can always go into uh, into cl uh, classic era. Uh, yeah, but we're yep. now we're now in the realm of a classic release that is releasing the thing that made it so that we needed classic in the first place. Correct. Um, yes, I I think there's some clever marketing here with like seven new zones. Like, yes, Kazan and Gilneas are new zones, but they're starter <laughs> experiences only. Yes, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You are not going to spend any time in these zones unless you are making a yeah. new goblin or a war game. I, I, I will. If you have not experienced Kazan, it is I mean, or Gilneas. They're both wonderful starting experiences. Oh, yeah. They were huge. The, the ending of what happens to Kazan to me is really interesting. I'm very glad they highlighted mm -hmm. that. It's it's a cool, they're cool stories. Definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it was it was definitely like a, a leap forward from how they sort of told outdoor story questing in earlier versions of the game. You know, like it was just a lot different. It, overall in Cataclysm, you, you had these sort of, you know, unifying stories that played through a zone, had a lot of IGCs and everything like that that would play out. Um, you know, they were kind of, I, I guess you would say primitive compared to where we've ended up, but it was sort of the first time they really leaned into that stuff more. Um, and yeah, the starter experiences were, they were a big upgrade from what we had before, but the difference was like, they weren't zones you could go hang out in after you finish the experience. They're not really part of the world in any significant way. So I did think it was kind of funny how they highlighted it. I'm going, there's seven zones in cataclysm, you know? Um, but yeah, I I mean I I'm not going to be playing this at all. I don't think I I barely played Wrath and I loved Wrath and I didn't like Cataclysm. So I'm just there's really no pull here for me. I I don't know. I Cataclysm was I think the first time that WoW ever really disappointed me. You know, as a player, I I loved uh, most of what I played for so long there those first six years. And there was a lot of stuff about Cataclysm that I did not like, and I don't think it held up very well over the course of its lifespan. I did like the Firelands patch, and I thought it was pretty good in the middle, but, you know, the opening and the closing patches were were rough. I didn't, I didn't enjoy them, so I, there's really nothing pulling me into this, and I feel like there's a lot more compelling stuff for me to be doing in, in WoW these days than this. Um... But you know, it was it was time for it to happen. Uh, you know, Wrath sort of had run its course, and so then it was only logical. Okay, like we we kind of know that their business model is just not that like these expansions are going to live forever. You know, right. vanilla is going to live forever, and the expansions are going to kind of come and go. But I guess the interesting thing will be to see after this runs its course, do they do mists? classic or do they not do that because they did remix and like maybe the whole classic expansion thing just comes to an end after this cycle it's possible i and i i feel like they will keep going i just do i feel like it they, they have a enough player base even if it's you know eighty thousand players or a hundred thousand players that are into classic that they're going to continue to just release classic stuff i i i, I also feel as though this probably requires 
very minimal amount of development time comparatively to other things that they're doing. I bet even Mop Remix probably was more work than doing Cataclysm Classic. Uh, so I, I feel like this is just easy content to release that pleases a particular group of players. And that's fine to do. They're yeah, not, they're, not I mean, keeping, like... they're not keeping error realms for all of these different things. They're literally right. overwriting the previous realms they had. So they're just maintaining the same player base. Yeah, like in the in the early days of classic, like they didn't have reference patches, you know, they didn't they didn't archive it that way. So they had yeah. to rebuild classic from the ground up, you know, and from they were using like external reference materials, like clients that were on old PCs or whatever. Um, you know, I, I have to imagine that by 2010, they had more of a an archival system for keeping, you know, WoW builds together. And so, yeah, you're right. It probably is easier to roll this out than it was a spin up classic in the first place. You have all the yeah. patches and, you know, you can you can push them to to production. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, well, I, I guess we'll just we'll see what happens. I didn't think they would do Cataclysm Classic, you know, at one point in time. I figured it was kind of Wrath was kind of a Wrath, natural yeah. endpoint. I thought Wrath was the endpoint. You know? I'm with you. But then it became pretty obvious they were going to do it. And it's like, well, I mean, this sort of, I mean, to me, classic WoW is those first three releases, Vanilla and the first two expansions. Yeah. You know, Cataclysm changes the, literally changes the world. It changes a lot of the, the kind of paradigm and it starts becoming a different thing. Although I guess yeah. like really, there is also like sort of a watershed there with Miss with redoing the talent system and everything like that. So I, I don't know. I I think the, the farther we go into expanded WoW, like I my interest continues to drop off. Like, yeah, I loved Miss. I loved Legion. Do I really want to play them again in a classic context? Like, I, I really just kind of don't. I, I think, to me, just v vanilla or variations on it are, well, are the more compelling thing. The, the interesting factor in this, right, is we have Mop Remix. So the question is, do they bother going to do a classic Mop at some point? Or are they just like, okay, classic goes up to this point, and then Remix fills in the rest of it. And we just see a, a different rotation almost of remixes <laughs> that start going into of okay, mop remix, yeah. and we'll move into this remix, and we'll do that remix, and then you know what? Let's just have them rotate where every six months or eight months or whatever we have a different remix that's rotating into being a live thing that people can go and play around with or whatever it is. Uh, so people who want to level characters that way can do it. People who want to experience that content again can do it. Um, well, you know, have more of a, a war a war bound. Uh, type of cloak situation where if you're playing remix your warbound cloak does this and so you can have a certain power level you start with based off of that like there's absolutely options to do things like that so i don't know it's a it's a curiosity to see what they choose to do with this stuff down the line for sure and whether or not we get those classics i think a, a mob classic would be a lot of fun personally that's one i might actually consider hopping into and playing a bunch of but I, whether or not they do it is, you know, uh, it's always up in the air until they actually say, hey, we're doing this. It's happening. Here's the release schedule over the next year. And it includes something like this, right? So I have to see how all that plays out. All right. Season of Discovery updates. We're going to shift into that part of Classic. Uh, this is a big blog post that we got from them, really just highlighting some important factors for the team. And that's that, obviously, they've been working really hard on Season Discovery and Classic. That's the same team who works on both of those. Uh, for, for Cataclysm Classic release. Um, there's been a lot happening in Classic right now, and they're working incredibly hard. And they've also been fairly quiet about the stuff that they've been working on when it comes to Season Discovery for a bit. And people have been waiting for, like, when's the announcement of Season 4? What's going to be happening with it? It's not Season, but Phase 4. What's going to be happening with it? And this is the part that they get into. So with the season, the Phase 4 release, they say cutting to it, cutting straight to it, and as you have no doubt likely noticed, World of Warcraft team has been delivering a lot of exciting content lately and will, of course, continue well through the next few months and beyond. As such, to land Phase 4 at just the right time, uh, currently they're in Phase 3, just so everyone is curious, is going to last longer than the previous season of Discovery. So they just write up, we're like, all right, we know that Phase 4 uh, is something that they want to put out. They know that their current phase three is going to last longer than other seasons is what they've sort of just told everybody. They can't share phase four's release date just yet. And they know that the news and the longer uh, phase three may be disappointing to some, but their timeline will ensure that the classic team delivers an experience worthy of players at high, at the high quality bar uh, we're all expecting from them. So 
what this post is saying right off the bat is we're going to be in phase three longer than we expect. We don't know when phase four is coming out and they know that that could disappoint some players. All right. We're so excited to share with you what's next. We also want to make sure that we take the time we need to deliver equal awesome experiences in both season discovery and cataclysm classic and give cataclysm classics launch the time it deserves to breathe without players feeling the pressure of needing to choose between it and all the other fun things happening in WoW right now. We understand our players love to pl love to plan, so we wanted our intentions to, to, stay, to signal our intentions now and let you know we intend to share the exact timing of Phase 4's launch and start discussing what it will include as early as possible to do so. So stay tuned for when Phase 4 stuff's happening. Uh, appreciate this. Also appreciate them trying to give WoW space to breathe on the different types of WoW that's out there and everyone being pulled in different directions as to what they're doing. Find it interesting that they're assuming people who are playing Season of Discovery are playing Cataclysm Classic. I know there is probably some crossover there. I'm not one of those crossovers, so it's just an interesting dynamic to look at. Their plans for Phase 4, uh, they have PTR plans coming up. So in a departure from previous phases, they're going to spin up a PTR specifically focused on combat and class testing for Phase 4. They plan to include level 60 templates with all runes and abilities learned, and we tentatively plan to uh, provide some sort of access to level 60 tier set pieces. We also plan to provide access to training dummies and some raid content, as well as battlegrounds, so that players can test out their new builds again. Their new builds. Again, our intent with this PTR is to focus on combat and class testing, and we will not be using it to test unique content coming in phase four. We've received an enormous amount of class feedback from players, and we're excited for the level 60 runes to be discovered, as well as our revamped tier sets. So yes, this is primarily there for them to test the balance of these classes, how their abilities work, and make sure their abilities are working properly for these classes. This isn't about checking out all the new content that's not going to be available. It is just strictly for testing balance and uh, how different abilities interact with runes. We're heavily investing into class adjustments going into phase four. And while perfect balance is not the goal, we do want to look at classes, specs, and runes that are underperforming and find opportunities to make as many improvements as we can. Many classes will see substantial redesigns going into the level 60 end game, with some runes moving around and others becoming baseline skills. We're excited for players to jump in and play around with these uh, substantial adjustments and participate in the feedback loop with us ahead of phase four hitting live realms. We'll share more information on our testing schedule soon. So yeah, I, 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 overall, I'm, I'm just going to highlight the first chunk of this post and Jason, you can comment as well uh, for sure. The news here being, hey, we recognize the players are very busy inside the classic world of what you're getting into. Season three, phase three is going to last longer than you expect. We don't know when phase four is coming out, but we know it's going to be longer than the two month cycle that we've seen for previous phases. And we want to be sure we're giving phase four the best opportunity it has for classes to be balanced and feel like there's a variety of specs and runes that you can run that'll be fun. So we're letting players test this sort of thing on PGR, which I think is great. I still think there's a lot of improvements to be made on rune acquisition and all these sorts of things uh, around the game for catching players up. But again, without them actually commenting on it, they might already have plans for that. So I'm excited to see what a lot of this testing looks like on PTR and give feedback on that. I'll probably hop in for a day and just goof around with things and see how stuff feels and give some feedback. Uh, I don't know if I will be active on the PTR regularly or testing a variety of classes and specs and that sort of thing, but I'll probably hop in and, and certainly give uh, give one, you know, my Druid stuff a shot and see what Druid's doing and see what I'm feeling about that. So we'll have to see what more future plans happen as far as release dates go, but I'm glad they're getting out ahead of this with this post. Yeah, it's, I mean, a PTR for Season Discovery is sort of blasphemous almost, but I think <laughs> with you. you know what I mean? Like, there's just, that yeah. was sort of the really cool thing with the launch, but it's funny, it was only back in November, but we you just can't go back there. We can't, we can't launch this again. And like, obviously, yeah. there, you know, I think there are reasons to look at the combat performance and try to get some data and feedback about that because that is, you know, players care about that no matter what version of WoW they're playing. They want their character to feel strong and um, and to feel fun to play. Um, I do, like, I can't help but think, like, reading this post, it's like we're kind of stuck in Phase 3 at this point. 
Um, whereas I felt like phase one was way too short and then phase two was like way, way too short. And I just wonder if maybe the overall release schedule was a little too ambitious to begin with. And maybe had we sort of padded out phases one and two a bit more then phase three might be a little healthier or something. I mean, you still have these concerns with publishing around all the other stuff going on in sure. the client. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think maybe like I really could have used a couple extra weeks in phase one. And then that may have carried over to me being a bit more amenable to, you know, putting time into phase two and actually leveling up. So to me, it, it, I don't know. I, I have regrets. It feels like a, some missed opportunities. And I kind of wish that, you know, they had, they had, beefed up those earlier phases a bit more because it seems like they're in a bit of a weird spot right now. I do wonder if the timeline for a lot of this, including the overlap with uh, Cataclysm Classic launch, was one of those things that came out of the blue for the team. Like they were sort of developing along their own path and then publishing was kind of like, hey, FYI, we need to get this out the door sooner than you expected. And it just kind of threw everyone off. Like I, I'm, I'm wondering if that kind of happened. And so they're like, okay, well, we should probably do a tweak or an adjustment or change to this. I do know that Season Discovery Phase 3 is not landing as well as Phase 2 based off of everything that I'm seeing around it. And I think a lot of that comes down to it just the 20-man raid content being something that did not hit as well as everyone hoped it would. Uh, I, I think a lot of teams are struggling to meet that 20-person on a regular basis uh, requirement to be able to clear the raid in a successful and smooth experience uh, i i know we have cleared the raid with 17 people before <laughs> and it is rough and we we definitely have a consistent team and the team's very good at what they do and uh there are definitely bosses that get quite out of control and take you know an entire evening to try and kill because of that so i i do feel like they uh they could certainly revisit some of phase three to make it more accessible to smaller groups and just say straight up, like, hey, we are nerfing boss health by 30% across the board on the bosses inside of this raid, which means that we feel the requirement for the amount of people you bring to raid should be lower, and teams that are already clearing it should be able to successfully clear it faster. That, to me, would be great to just sort of see that of, hey, here's an easy way to be like, yep, guess what? You can bring 14 people to the raid and still clear it. Don't worry, you don't need 20. Like, that, I think, would be a smart decision to make right. at some point. Um, it's yeah. tough, man. I, I mean, I think that was sort of the, you know, that was the moment when they were like, okay, we're going from 10 to 20 player raids. So it's yeah. like, well, you sort of, I mean, granted, it wasn't a very long amount of time, but, you know, you had established that, okay, this is like a 10 player experience, which is, yeah. I mean, it's a big ask to double the size of your team. Yes, it is. Especially, especially considering that the most interest it was ever going to have was day one of phase one. And then you're sort of just, you know, shedding people as time goes along. It's just yeah. a natural, natural thing that happens, yeah. right? You're going to end up with fewer people in phase three than played phase one. Yeah. And now you're asking them to bring twice as many people to a raid. It's daunting, you know? I mean, the sort of uh, ZTH contingent of season discovery has completely fallen off. Nobody plays it anymore. It's just done. Right. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it's it's tough. But I, I do think it was sort of a, I, I guess, like, ultimately what they, I can only assume that the plan is, we're going to ramp into traditional level 60 raids, 40 man, molten core, etc. So we got to get you from 10 to 40 players. I wish that there maybe was a different way to solve that. Like either tune it down, flex it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how possible this is to do on vanilla WoW data or, or whatever, or how blasphemous this is to suggest, right? To have like flex raids and season discovery. But, you know, ultimately you need a level of participation that you're not always going to be able to get. And, um, I think that was, I mean, some of that peer pressure uh, or whatever you want to call it, to me, that was also sort of a thing that I started feeling at the end of phase one and into phase two was like, well, the people in my network are not really interested in continuing to play this. And so that's going to limit my opportunities. I don't really want to find some other place to play. So I have other stuff I would rather be doing anyway. And, I, right. you know, I think that's that could be a challenge for SOD since it is sort of like a if it's like a, a, a side project, you know, I, I think for a lot of players, you know, if they're classic players, they're playing whatever the current classic content is or they're playing era or, you know, whatever the case may be. And then and then they're doing some SOD stuff or they're playing, you know, retail and moonlighting and SOD. A bunch of us were doing that that I that I know. So it's tough. I mean, if they could have just kept it all 10 men all the way up, I, that, I, think, I think that would have been yeah. beneficial. I think that would have been a really unique and cool experience to try and be like, all right. We get that in phase one, you might get together with your group of 12 friends, two of which can kind of make it sometimes. 
and basically put together a raid team and start slogging through stuff and enjoying the progression and the content of what's going on. And we are going to allow you to carry that same group of friends all the way through the season discovery experience, I think would have been really neat. I think the moment they start expanding up to 20 people, I, I get if the goal is, hey, we eventually want people to be doing maybe one 40 person raid that you're going to have to like merge and work with another raid team to sort of have that happen. And we recognize that's a thing. Uh, then you do need to start allowing people to grow earlier on with this content. But I, I, I honestly think it was, in, in my opinion, I think it's a mistake to go anything above 10 at the moment inside Season of Discovery. I think it's just very difficult to find a consistent group of people uh, that are, you know, 20 people or more that can get together two nights a week at first moving down to one night a week later to be able to clear this content on a regular basis and have fun doing it. I just, I think that's a, that's a struggle for a lot. So I, uh, I think that was, there was mistakes made in that sort of thing. All right. Level 60 content phases. They go on to talk a little bit about this. One common question we've been asked is how will the various raid tiers roll out at 60? And we want to provide some clarity and let everyone know that we will be rolling out raids in similar phases, similar to what we did in 2019's classic. The first tier will consist of Molten Core and Anixia, and a few weeks after that, we will see Blackwing Lair, followed by Zul Groob, with additional endgame content surprises that we're planning to add between the major raid tier releases as well. For ease of communication, we intend to frame our releases around the familiarity, the familiar original WoW raid tiers. Sunken Temple adjustments incoming. One consistent piece of feedback we've received uh, is that the rewards from Sunken Temple have been a bit underwhelming. During our design and testing of Phase 3, we didn't entirely know the scale and scope of adjustments we'd make to level 60 gear, uh, level 60 dungeon gear, uh, tier 1 item sets, and Molten Core and Anixia gear. Now that we have a good idea about those and what those look like, we think <laughs> it makes sense to increase the power level of some of the Sunken Temple gear. These updates will allow particular, uh, particularly focus on caster gear, which, uh, will fe which feels the most underpowered, apparently. Uh, we'll let you know when we've got this uh, ready to implement the live game. We want, you know, to give a heartfelt expression of thanks and blah, blah, blah for everyone who enjoys Season Discovery and Classic, the WoW team. All right. So I am weirded by, by this. All right. So first of all, content phase releases, great. Same releases make sense. Totally cool. Good. Yay. Thumbs up. All right. Adjustments to Sunken Temple. This is an interesting thing to me because I am still wearing raid gear from phase two in phase three rating because it was strong enough in phase two that I couldn't find upgrades between phase two and phase three outside of going into the raid. The raid gear in phase three is better than the raid gear in phase two, not dramatically better, but it is better. So when you get pieces from it, you do replace the pieces you have. But I also expect that the raid gear I'm getting in phase three will pretty much carry me to the raids at 60 in phase four. I pretty much expect that that's what's going to happen because of the pattern that we've seen so far. Phase one raid gear carried me into phase two raid. Uh, so I didn't mind that that was something that was happening, but I wouldn't have called the gear underpowered. Uh, I think that's a little surprising to hear them say that. Um, there is gear you can earn through the outdoor uh, questing events that they have, um, the Emer Emerald Nightmare stuff that they have, that is a, a actual set that you can buy that is really not that super expensive at all. And that is gear that is basically on par with the phase two raid gear. Um, so you are replacing that out of phase three raid, but you know, it, it just to me was neat to be like, here's a level 50 version of essentially the, the phase two raid gear as a catch up mechanic for folks who just hit max level and want to get into sunken temple. Um, I, I, I'm curious as to these casters who are complaining. I mean, casters will always complain, but I'm curious as to these casters who are complaining about their gear being underpowered. I'm, I'm ex excited, I guess, to see what they choose to do change wise. Cause yeah, that's uh that's a good one. I, I will say that warriors, uh, paladins, um, melee hunters. So your, your, your survival hunters are all very, very strong in DPS, but I wouldn't have put mages too far off from them uh from from doing that i just know that survival hunters are broken and they have like the easiest rotation in the world and they can just spam one button over and over again and do 80 percent of their damage and top the meters uh so that's something that a lot of people struggle with at the moment but uh i i look forward to changes to the gearing i still just think that they should go yeah we're just going to nerf the raid by 20 or 30 percent health across the board and you know trash now falls over easier you can plow through it easier it's an easier content for people to clear and 
people can get their alts in there and start doing that kind of content. And I think that's that's what Season Discovery was initially about, is like, hey, I want to level more than one character, try out all these different runes on more than one character. And at the moment, it's like, yeah, the raid content just isn't accessible enough for a group of 12 people or 14 people to get in and actually do anything with it. And I think that's unfortunate because I think that's where the majority of groups kind of lie at the moment, numbers wise, it's hard to get a 20 person group together. Yeah. And I think the gearing, uh, the overall gear design and like gearing ramp is a kind of a tricky needle to thread for them. And, uh, you know, I say that because you want rig gear to be good, but you also don't want it to be required. And so then you end up in a situation where like, is the raid gear good enough? And like, is it okay if, you know, phase two raid gear is better than phase three raid gear? It's all level up gear. So what is sort of the power threshold that we're looking to, to be at, right? And that's compared to also every, all the, you know, traditional stuff that you can acquire. So it is, it's, it's a little bit tough. You know, I, I felt like my character was super strong by the end of phase one at level 25 with crafted gear and raid drops and whatever. Um, but, you know, should you have to do that in order to kind of progress in the current phase when the phases are rolling out after two months or whatever? And then if you didn't do that, then you get into phase three and you want to do Sunken Temple. Like you need to be able to get yeah. stuff that's going to make you feel strong against that content. So, yeah, that's um, that seems tricky and it seems harder to do the longer you go and the higher the level cap goes. So, um I think, you know, at, at this point, it's probably easier because you're farther along, right? You're in the phase three, you're up to level 50 or whatever. I think it's probably easier to go, okay, like we're going to make legit, like strong gear. We can, we can make this gear not necessarily required, but we can give it a clear advantage because we are close to the point of like max level. But then you, you also then have the problem of like, if we're going back to Molten Core and Onyxia, can, do you want to make gear that's going to step on that yeah. potentially, right? So there's like there's like a, a ceiling that you have to stay beneath as well. Um, it's a little tricky. I, I mean, all that stuff probably won't matter once we're into Phase 4 and we're into the level 60 cap, but I guess the ongoing question once we get to that point is what is going to be different enough about SOD in a, in the level 60 cap world in a world with you know your traditional couple first you know uh vanilla raids like what's going to be different enough about it that is interesting to play uh you know what and that's i, I mean that, that's the stuff that we just don't know yet and i think that's going to be the big test for the ongoing viability of of the mode and the sod servers yeah i i do feel like seeing how this pacing works out, seeing how the gear pacing works out, seeing how the content feels is going to be something that uh, is going to be really important for phase four because that's essentially like, we'll get a phase five, but it's just phase four is going to be the defining end game kind of tier that we sort of get into that will have players really deciding whether or not this was successful or not. I think overall <laughs> when we get through it. So we'll have to see if that and how well that lands. And I'm glad they're taking the time to PTR test to hopefully make sure that at least some of the classes and class balance and, and runes and whatnot are landing the way they should. Uh, I think that's certainly going to be a helpful thing for them. All right. With that, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons. They contribute a ton to our show and help us improve on the content we create. Today, I'm giving a shout out to Alianas, Arajian, James, Kapawi, Max, Pinky, Shoral, and Rager. Thank you so much for all that you give, as well as all of our patrons who contribute and help our show. They head on over to patreon.com slash the starting zone and they can hop in and support our show and you can hop in and support our show too. We don't have any new patrons to speak about and shout out today, but thank you to everyone who, who supports the show and helps us continue to produce episodes like this one every week. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, patrons, past and present. I mean, your support makes the show possible, helps us keep everything online, all the archives and everything and get new episodes produced for you. So... We really appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. So thanks for, for chipping in. The other great way to support the show is heading over on over to your iTunes or Apple podcast and leaving us those five-star reviews. This one comes in from a broken phone, which hopefully wasn't an iPhone because that'd be very expensive. Entitled, Great Show. Says, the podcast is a great show. I enjoy listening while I'm at work. Spencer and Jason are great hosts. I have learned so much from listening and have learned and have learned a lot jumping back into WoW since BFA. Thank you for all the episodes and I can't wait to hear more especially when the latest expansion comes out. Keep up the good work, guys. Well, thank you, A Broken Telephone. 
uh, man, it is, uh, it is exciting to talk about like what's happening with war within. I can't imagine when this thing launches, it's going to be a massive, massive period of time for content creation and putting out episodes for you all and talking about what's happening in the game. And man, I, I, I really do feel like the, the Dragonflight has successfully done what it needed to do in teeing up the next expansion. I'm, I, and I feel like so far what we've seen of War Within, it is going to be the, you know, big hit that we need it to be. So I, I am, I am very hopeful and excited for talking about that stuff when it comes out. Yeah. You know, I think, um, I mean, Dragonflight, I think has landed in my top three ever at this point. And uh, I think War Within is, it looks like it's on track to take a lot of lessons from Dragonflight mm -hmm. about what to do and hopefully just avoid some of the few pitfalls that I feel like Dragonflight really had. So that's awesome. But I mean, on this episode of the show, we've talked about five different versions of World of Warcraft that you can play right now or yep. shortly, I guess. It, it, you know, it's it's 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Yep. Uh, so we can't quite play Cataclysm Classic yet. But still, I mean, there's, there's a lot to do with your subscription and, and inside the client. And... Uh, um, I mean, not everything is going to be for everybody, but, you know, we'll continue to keep an eye on it and, and definitely get into whatever it is that we're, you know, finding that we're spending time on for sure. Um, I do. It is going to be weird, like with a new expansion launching into this world where there's so much different stuff. I mean, obviously, MOP remakes will be spun down by then. But, um, yeah, it's just uh, I don't know. You know, normally. We're at this point of an expansion. It's like, okay, well, we're sort of just taking the summer off of anything even remotely interesting happening in World of Warcraft until the expansion comes yeah, out. Yeah. And instead, it's like, okay, well, you know, retail is still vibrant. There's still plenty of fun to be had in, in Dragonflight um, in the live game. You know, Remix is is, is, a, is a definitely a, an experiment, and there's definitely some rough edges, but it, it, there is something about it that's interesting and, and worth checking out. And then you know, SOD is in that same vein, really. I mean, it's not the same teams that, that made this stuff, but SOD is a similar, I think, kind of fits into that whole uh, experimental kind of stuff that they've been doing this past year of just, like, different ways to envision WoW or, like, what it can be, how it can play, what you can do with it, what you can do with content. So, um, I don't know. I mean, there was an article in, in PC Gamer this week about how WoW is in, like, a, a new golden age, and... I, you know, the guy who wrote it had a very different perspective and playstyle than I do, but I couldn't really disagree with this point. Like, I, I I don't know if this is straight up the best any version of the game has ever been. I mean, Dragonfly is a very good version of the game, but yeah. in terms of, like, the breadth of experience you can have inside the WoW client, I don't think there's any comparison. I think this is definitely the best time ever to be a it's, WoW player, regardless of, like, what your particular flavor yeah, is. Yeah, it's definitely the best I, value yeah. for your sub that we've ever seen. That's, that's a, a nice way of putting it, for sure, yeah. Is I don't think we've ever seen a better time, a better era of World of Warcraft where being subscribed to it got you this amount of content and, you know, potential for finding something that fits what you want to do with your time inside World of Warcraft, which is pretty unique. And as you said, like, normally right now, this is where Jason and I are like, all right, so let's do an episode where we, like, bring on a guest and talk about their experience with something, or this is the time where we highlight and focus on a particular system inside of the game and like figure out a way essentially to make an episode out of not having a lot of news going on right now. Like the, the actual Dragonflight news right now on its own with season four, even we normally would be in season three back in the day still uh, with season four even was, you know, what's going on this week and a couple of hotfix things here and there, but not anything that was major, huge release news. And so if we talk about what wow was like eight years ago, Right now, it's season three. There's not a whole lot going on, and we are finding n interesting episode topics to try and cover to try and fill the hour and 15 minutes that we're probably getting something in. And this week, we're doing almost a two-hour episode talking about five different versions of World of Warcraft during a time when, you know, this is that normally a shortened episode format. So, yeah, it's, it, is, it is definitely in a very good spot as far as the game goes, and there's certainly a lot to talk about and a lot to explore, and... I feel like there is something out there for anyone's playstyle who's trying to do something right now with the game, which is pretty fantastic. Okay. I guess we have hit that point where I'm going to wrap up episode 632 of The Starting Zone. If you want to check out show notes for this episode or you want to leave a comment on the show, you can head on over to thestartingzone.com, the official website for The Starting Zone podcast. You can also reach out to us 
and leave your feedback or question uh, at our email address, which is the starting zone at gmail.com or reach out to us on Twitter at the starting zone, or you can join our discord server where there's plenty of discussion happening, particularly around mob remix at the moment over at the starting zone.com slash discord. That'll get you in there. And if you want to get your hands in some TSE gear, you can find that over at T public. That's T E E public.com slash stores slash the starting zone. You can check out all designs on shirts and mugs and stickers. And Jason, where can folks find you on the internet? Best place to find me as always is over on Twitter, although I guess it's not actually twitter.com anymore, but um, that's still what I want to call it. So you can find me over there at Shieldwald. You can also find me on Blue Sky at Jay Lucas. Uh, I, you can find stream at twitch.tv slash Shieldwald and youtube.com slash Shieldwald. I haven't been streaming the last couple weeks just because I haven't really been up to it, so I don't know. I, I kind of came back briefly and then I disappeared again. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to be streaming for, on Wednesday for sure because I won't be home. But uh, maybe I'll throw a stream up for raid and stuff tomorrow. Um, but you can check it out, and I'll you know I'll post in in the TSC Discord and on Twitter and stuff when I'm going to go live. So usually I like to stream raid stuff and just kind of hang out. Nice. Trying to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey or over on Blue Sky at Spencer HD. Uh, you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD or on youtube.com slash at Spencer HD. And with that, for Jason and myself, thanks for listening and jobs done.